Okay, good morning, Living Grace. How's everyone doing? Hello. Hi, is it morning yet? I just, <laughs> is it light? Uh, okay, let's live in a little bit, right? Good morning, good to, great to see you. Let's all rise, we worship and praise together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your kindness, Father. Uh, thank you for your presence here. Uh, thank you, Father. Uh, let us never, never take Sunday morning just like everything happened that usual thing happened every Sunday, Father. Um, every time we stand here, worship your great name, Father, it's our only opportunity and the great opportunity to be in your presence and worship your great name, Father. So be glorified in everything that we do this morning. We love you. We praise your name with everything that we have. In the powerful name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen.
No way. 
lover of my soul, lover of my soul. Nobody like him. Nobody like you. Nobody like you. No one, no end. No one, no That he is our Lord. There's no one above him, no one beside him. It's only him. And he calls us his own. Hallelujah. Oh, you call me out of darkness. You silence it. You call me out of darkness. You silence every light, and no other voice will find me. I belong to you.
greater, greater who are in me than he who he who is in, in the world. You don't have to fear anything. We always say that God's omnipresent, He's everywhere. He's big enough to fill the entire universe. He's in our heart. What will happen is that when He's in our heart, His grace, His love will overflow. It will overflow around us, to our family, to where we work. We don't say, you know, uh, you can't hide a Christian. If you're a Christian, you can't hide it because His grace will overflow you. Let's sing His grace in us, His presence in us this morning.
Hallelujah. In worship, we, we enter your pre- throne room, Father, in your presence. How great it is to be in your presence, Father, and worship your great name. And we know there are those who cannot openly worship you, Lord. We are standing here for them as well, Father. We openly worship your great name, Father. You are everything to us. You r e the king of the king, king of this universe, Father. We give everything that we have to you, Lord. We just sing, Father, let your grace and love overflow in our life, Father, in this country, in our family, Father. Lord, you are you're the center of everything that we do this morning. So, Father, be the center in everything that we do this morning. In our life, we give our life to you, Lord. In the p o p l i f t Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Hallelujah. All the praise is to me. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, today. You all look so beautiful. Okay, if you're visiting for the first time, we are so glad you're here. Welcome. We have a table in the back. Please stop by and see Jerry and Steve. They have a little gift for you. Um, if you're visiting online, welcome. We're so glad you tuned in. There is a connect option um, online, so please connect. Um, but we're so glad you're all here or online. A few announcements. Ladies, it's time to kickstart. Our 2023 um, connection with our first Koinia of the year, February 4th at 10 a.m. 10 p.m. 10 a.m. That'd be a late night. Um, in the church sanctuary. So come out, receive the tools we perceive the Lord has given us for our abundant new year of living joyful, healthy, and whole. Hope to see you all there. There's no cost, but we are asking all of our ladies to please sign up online. So we can get a number. We are hosting a baptism right here in the church, in the sanctuary, um, Sunday, February 5th. <laughs> Immediately after the second service. There will be a potluck, a- potluck afterwards uh, for those that you would like to, to participate in the celebration. So if you would like to be baptized, um, please sign up online as well. How to Study Your Bible Workshop is scheduled Saturday, February 18th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary. God's Word has a powerful, has the power, power sorry, to transform your life and the lives of those around you. But in order for that change to occur, we must dedicate ourselves um, to the faithful reading and studying of the scriptures as we are instructed in 2 Timothy. Come and learn how to discover the truths in God's word for yourself instead of relying on others' interpretations um, of the Bible. The workshop is free, but we do ask that you guys sign up online. All right. Youth, you are dismissed. Thank you. Pastor l u c i Hey, boom. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks, sister. <laughs> So that's the hot section over there, huh? Mm-hmm. What up, what up, my people over there? I see y'all. Hey, uh, uh, one of my mentors has a, um, uh, a ministry uh, opportunity where he's always been very community-minded, and they are offering um, uh, training programs for young, young adults, 18 to 24 years old, who are interested in being automotive technicians. Now, if you're a mechanic, you're probably like, what's he talking about? I don't know. That's what he told me. And uh, he said that um, they will pay you for the instruction. There's 90 hours of training. And then there's this process where you uh, spend hours in the classroom and hours uh, actually working at a facility. 
starts at $16 an hour. Um, yeah, that got your attention, huh? Yeah. Someone's like, oh, what did he say? What was that? And it is something that um, is, uh, would be, for someone, uh, 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 young men or young women that might be interested in, um, in that as a career, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, he's always been involved in initiatives that help train young people uh, who are looking for something. And so if you're interested in that, let me know. Time is of the essence. It's one of those things where he has to know in the next couple of weeks. And, um, but because he's a kingdom man, he wanted to make sure that, um, that I, I let you guys know because he always wants to include the body of Christ in the things that he's doing. And that's what, that's what a kingdom man or a kingdom woman do Whatever they do, they're always thinking about how can we be a blessing to our community uh, and our church. And so wanted you to um, know that. And so also, um, we always like to um, acknowledge men and women of God that are traveling through town or relatives or mine or former UNLV running rebels or... Um, this thing is one other thing too, but... Uh, Thank you, sir. I work alone. <laughs> Appreciate it, though. I really do. I really do. Appreciate it. What are you going to say to that? No, we don't. Of course we do. Like, I want to get home safely today. Of course we acknowledge retired Marines. And the Navy's going. Uh, Mark, would you introduce? Come on, man. Stand up, man. Zoom the camera in on them, please. If you No, go ahead, bro. Amen. And I love it. Retired preacher. We need to talk afterwards, man. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's in quotation, all right? <laughs> Retired. Thank you. Thank you for your service to the kingdom of God. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this morning, I want to invite you into an abundant life. That's not a word that we use a whole lot of. If you're familiar with the words of Jesus, you kind of understand abundant life. Um, if you would ask me when I was 25, it, could you define the abundant life? I assure you it would be a different answer then than when I was 35. <laughs> um, Jesus said that he, he has come, among other things, that we might have life. And that word life is zoe. Zoe in the Greek language means not just health or wealth, bills paid, stomach full, you know, you just had a full meal at John Mole's uh, barbecue. That is an abundant life. But it's not what Jesus was talking about. It's not that you're functioning physically well. The abundant life is something that's much, much deeper than that. It satisfies the innermost being. It's something that you cannot get anyplace else. Maybe you've said this at one time. You were in some environment with some friends or family and you said to yourself, it just doesn't get any better than this. And it turns out it does. It does. Because that statement is usually made when everything is sort of in a perfect scenario. You're up at Brian Head and you just got a foot and a half of powder. Yeah. It gets better than that. Because the, the abundant life is Zoe. And it comes from Jesus. Young people, abundance of life comes from Jesus. It doesn't come anyplace else. To our more mature senior people, you'll have to excuse me, 
my wife just walked in and I am sorely distracted right now. <laughs> she tried to sneak in. It's been 28 years, girl. You can't sneak in no more. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> um, abundant life. It's probably not what you think it is. It's probably not what you think it is. We've been talking about authority. <clears throat> authority. I should wear a suit and a tie when I say that in church. And I apologize now if you've ever experienced authority gone wrong in the church. If you've ever experienced because of a individual or denomination or a religious system that yielded the sword of authority without any grace at all. I, I'm sorry for that. That is not the heart of Jesus. The Bible tells us to, to love one another and to speak the truth in love. All truth and no love is error. And all love with no truth is error too. There's a balance. And so I'm inviting you this morning to the abundant life. I hope that you will join me in this as I grow in it. Let's all stand and we'll get into God's Word. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 because we always like to take it back to the beginning. I am in the Amplified Bible. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for your grace and your mercy for today. God, we, we, we ask you to speak by your Holy Spirit to that innermost being. Speak to our hearts. Lord, I, I, um, I don't feel like I have to tell you that I have nothing to offer because you already know that. And hopefully so does everyone here, but you have something to offer. And so, Lord, would you speak and would you give us ears to hear? And whatever it is we think we should hear about this or what we think we know, Lord, would you just write the canvas on our heart of what you want to say? And we receive it now and we say, Lord, give us the grace to obey and to follow in Jesus' precious holy name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Give someone a high five and have a seat if you would, please. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 in the Amplified Bible says this, Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea the birds of the air the cattle and over the entire earth and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth how many wish you had authority over things that creep and crawl on the earth <laughs> sorry so god created man in his own image in the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, granting them certain authority. And said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subjugate it. That is, putting it under your power. Remember, authority comes first, then comes power. And rule over, dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. Fast forward to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good and he validated it completely and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Adam, distinct from all creation, made in the image of God, we could call him if we were in England, Lord Adam and Lady Eve, he is the king. He stands in authority in the garden and beyond. God has granted him that authority. Immediately we hear one of, if not the most important aspect of his identity. This is critical. This is critical for human beings to understand. He is made in the image of God. Animals, plants, uh, stars, angels are not made in the image of God. Adam is 
unique and distinct. And remember, society and demonic forces, Satan always wants to remove the distinctions that God has established. Sometimes people seem to care more about animal kind than they do mankind. And almost as if Mother Nature is elevated to a place of worship, which is essentially witchcraft, uh, versus the worship of the one who created everything in the stars, uh, the stars and the universe. The image of God, you cannot understand who you are until you understand who God is. You cannot truly understand your core identity, and, and I, this gets to, the, to the, the, the very inward core of who you are. If you do not understand who God is, you cannot understand uh, uh, who you are because you are made in His image. There is an infinite gap between human kind and animal kind. There may be biological, some differences. We are distinct morally, intellectually, and spiritual capabilities. There is an infinite gap between mankind and everything else. By the way, uh, today is the National Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. How about we live in a society when you have to say human life? Because it is important. Um, happy to, pr to say that um, the Born Alive Survivors of Abortion Protection Act has passed Congress. Uh, that means that in the event of an abortion gone right and the fetus baby survives, that it is incumbent upon the doctor to perform emergency services and not just let that child die. Okay, thank you. Congressman Mark Amaday, Nevada Congressman, we acknowledge and give him props for being the only congressman in the, congressperson in Nevada who believes that we should have, that baby should be protected. No one else did. And so you can take that up with whomever you voted for in our last election cycle. Um, also passing Congress is the condemning violence against pro-life groups like First Choice. You might be familiar with the bombings and the raids and the things that have been taking place at pro-life uh, pregnancy centers and even some churches, um, they're now protected as if they need to have a special designation. But remember, when it comes to abortion, there is this thing that's called abortion distortion. Because when it comes to abortion, all the rules change. Anyway, we're, we're happy to report on those things. And that is because human life has intrinsic value apart from the quality of life, the experience of life, uh, or that they might experience, the environment that they might be born into, the... the physical or even mental um, uh, challenges that a baby may have, that child is made in the image of God and therefore has intrinsic value. We as followers of Jesus believe in the value of human beings from the womb to the tomb. Can you say amen to that? Remember that society wants to break down the distinctions of God. And if you do not know that humans are made in the image of God and they are distinct, it is a very thin line from that to believing that human beings are worthless. And that certain ones have value and certain ones don't. <sighs> Unique. Distinct. Man alone shares in God's communicable attributes. Life, personality, truth, wisdom, love, holiness, justice, worship, self-awareness, conscience. Distinct in authority. Because this is what we've been talking about over the last couple weeks is authority. Adam was distinct in his authority and his participation with God. 
Adam was declared king of creation. He was commanded with Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subjugate it by putting it under his power, which means to rule, to dominate all living things. God allowed Adam to participate in that by telling him, you name the animals because when you have authority, you give names to things. Adam had the responsibility, the authority to work in the garden, to care for it, this beautiful home, this beautiful place. Some people think that work is a result of the fall. It turns out it's not. And you're thinking, well, pastor, you don't know my job. Okay, I don't, maybe I don't. But work dignifies a person. I think we have to be careful with how we help people in need, and we have to be biblical and, se and, and sensible and caring because at some point everybody needs a hand up. But we have to be careful that we don't rob someone created in the image of God the dignity of working. Amen. When we give and there's no requirement at all, that's not always the best thing to do because we're robbing that person of the dignity of work. Now, don't be mad at me. I understand there's, there's circumstances, but I'm saying in general, I think we don't require enough of people who ask for help. Please, in general, I'm not being insensitive. But there's a certain dignity that goes with that. Adam was to exercise power over the earth because he was given authority by God. Adam, you're the man. This is your place. Exercise authority in this place. I'm giving you that. And it was great, right? The Lord said it was good. It was very good. All of it. Until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. You know the story. Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan, the serpent, who was named serpent by Adam, which means he had authority, I believe, even over Satan, the serpent. He convinces Eve to question the word of God. Did, 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 did God really say this? Confusion comes in, doubt. She partakes of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said, everything in the garden is yours. Love it. Enjoy it. This is life. It doesn't get any better than this. And there was only one command. One. You could say it was a test. Because love must always be tested. If it's not tested, it's not love. Adam and Eve had to choose to follow God and submit to his authority somehow. This goes to show you the heart of man is consistent even in a perfect environment. We tend to think, well, it's because of the environment. No, it's because of the heart. They take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and everything changes. Everything changes. Now there are new vocabulary words that they have to learn, like death and sweat and toil and enmity, warfare, if you would, thorns and thistles and God levies penalties on Satan, Eve, Adam, and all of creation gets tilted. It says in the penalty against the serpent, chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman Eve and between your offspring and her offspring and uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
This is called by many the proto-evangelium, the first announcement of the gospel that says to the serpent Satan, there is going to be a seed of the woman who will eventually come through much warfare and through, through much hardship and, and much history. Thousands of years later, there will come one who will one day crush your head, though you bruise his heel. Which crucifixion, that's what historians tell us, one of the aspects of those crucified was a bruised heel because of the weight that bore down on the heel, depending on how they were crucified. There would be warfare, there would be enmity, but he's saying there's coming one who will make things right. Listen to this, Luke chapter 1, verse 31. This is the descriptor of the seed of the woman, Jesus, where it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And, his ki and to his kingdom and of his kingdom there will be no end. Do you hear the authority in that? His kingdom. Last week, we, if you were with us, Nebuchadnezzar said that same thing, essentially. So there's going to be a change. There's going to be, a, 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 there's going to be a, 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 a making right of that which was wrong. To the woman, God says this in Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will give birth to children. Yet your desire and longing will be for your husband and he will rule with authority over you and be responsible for you. Everything has changed from an earthly perspective. Now everything is even changing within the relationship between husband and wife. Now, which once flowed, Adam, who was uh, the, the leader, if you would, uh, of his own home and had authority in his own home. Now there's going to be this agitation and there's going to be conflict and there's going to be difficulty that takes place. There's a, there's a, a challenge to the husband's role as a leader of the home. The same word there for desire, yet your desire and longing will be for your husband is the same one used in Genesis chapter 4 verses 7 for the desire of sin to master Cain. Because of the curse, Eve would have to fight a desire to master her husband and to raise up against her husband and a desire that would work against God order in the home. The principle of Adam's headship in the home has already been established in the garden. Before the fall, one writer uh, says this, As a result of the fall, man no longer rules easily. He must fight for his headship. Sin has corrupted both the willing submission of the wife and the loving headship of the husband. The woman's desire is to control her husband, to usurp his divinely appointed leadership, and he must master her if he can. So the rule of love founded in paradise is replaced by struggle, tyranny, and domination. Even the relationship between husband and wife is now agitated. Back to Satan, there was a time when Satan had authority because he was seemingly very close to God, the most anointed cherub. There are some who say that he may have even had the ability to produce music, and there's a reference for that. This one in Ezekiel chapter 28 speaks about a human and then it speaks about something much greater than that. And oftentimes in the scripture, there's a discussion about a man or a king. And then it, it steps out of that and it speaks of something much greater than that. Who's, someone who's not a mere human. This says, you were an anointed cher uh, guardian cherub. I placed you there uh, where on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. This is obviously not a human. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. 
I believe this is speaking of Satan who raised up in rebellion to God and because he wanted to ascend to the throne and even be, seat himself above God, he was cast down. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus perhaps is referencing this when he says that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And we know that ultimately, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, Satan will fall into the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, which we commonly know as hell, and that's in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. I believe that Satan retained his power though he lost his authority when he rebelled against God. Remember, authority is given based on relationship. Satan rebelled against God and lost the authority that he had in heaven. Obedience and submission brings authority in the kingdom of God, as does relationship or closeness to God. <clears throat> Satan, I believe, took away Adam's authority over the earth. Why do I say that? Everything changed. Everything. Notice the penalty to Adam after the sin. Genesis 3.17, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, uh, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground out of which, uh, out, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. And the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of the living and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. They had clothed themselves with leaves and in a way to hide from one another and to hide from God. Anyway, fast forward to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has a conversation with Satan Listen to what he offers Jesus. Verse 8 says, Again, the devil took him to a, very, uh, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Here is Satan who understands authority, who says, If you worship me, you will lose your authority God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold angels came and were ministering to him. Every time Satan tempts you, he wants authority over you. Every time we succumb to that temptation and we walk in sinful ways and sinful patterns, Satan's authority grows over us until if he has his way, it'll be utter dominion and domination and death. Romans 6.16 says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. When we sin, we, gave, we give Satan more authority over us, and more authority, and more authority, and we lose what little we may have. Jesus, the sinless one, in whom there is no darkness at all, who never sinned in word or thought or deed, has the ultimate authority because he never sinned even when Satan himself tempted him. Also, because of his closeness to God. 
to the degree that you are close with God and walking in obedience, to that degree you walk in authority. The closer you are, the more authority you have. To the degree that you're apart from God, to that degree Satan has authority over you. And the further you get from God, the more authority Satan has. That's why Satan does not want you and me to know the truth. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. How many of you, when you came to know Jesus, you recognize you have been hoodwinked? If I could use an old phraseology. You, you, I, I was a little bit mad. Because I, I felt like, I, I'm like, man, you know, I've been serving Satan all of these years. Man, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Man, I just gave so much of my, oh, no, it's on now. Okay, that was, you know, brand new Christian. I wasn't challenging Satan. I was just angry that I, 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 I had given so much of my life to sin. And if you would have asked me, are you a, are you a slave? Oh, I, I would have... We fight now. You call, what are you calling me? Oh, no, but I was a slave. See, I was a slave to sin, but I didn't know it. Well, I probably did. <laughs> I just probably wouldn't admit it, but I was. Then you know the truth. And all of a sudden, you have this realization. And you're set free. Whom the sun sets free. Is free indeed. Authority comes through relationship. Here's the thing. We don't have to work for our salvation. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you don't have to worry if you're still saved tomorrow morning? Oh, I don't know. Am I? Am I? Am I not? Am I? Am I not? No, no. No. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, if you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, if you've, if you've repented of your sin, if you've turned to him, if you've asked him to be your Lord, your Savior, your Master, your owner, then you are under his authority and no one can snatch you, snatch you out of his hands. Yeah. But aren't you glad you don't have to work for your salvation? But here's what we do have to work at, relationship. What do I mean by that? Well, it's like marriage. Marriage takes work. It's ongoing. Doesn't matter how long you've been married. There's always something new to learn. Um, in my marriage, for example, early on in our marriage, my wife would say, I'd say, where do you want to go eat? And she'd say, doesn't matter. Any place is fine. I'd say, how about here? And she'd go, no, no. <laughs> And the first time that happened, I thought, okay, so then it does matter, but why would she say it doesn't matter? I'll try again. How about this place? <laughs> no, no. And then I thought, it really does matter where we go. <laughs> what's, I know what's happening here. Notice I'm looking at this, this way because my wife's over here. <laughs> the lovely. What's really happening is, when she says it doesn't matter, she says, keep giving me a list, bucko, and when I find the one I like, we'll go there. <laughs> Got it. That takes work. When you're hanging out with the dudes, and you go, where y'all want to go eat? And they say, it don't matter. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> They're not going to go, I don't feel like tacos. What is your problem? <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Stay in the car. <laughs> and then she said, can you hang this picture on the wall? I said, sure, honey. Where do you want it hung? She goes, it doesn't matter. I went, ah, yes, it does. <laughs> and just to prove a point, I'm having this conversation in my head because this is work, but it's okay because I'm in love and I don't mind working in my marriage. I go, how about here? She goes, no. I knew it. <laughs> yes. Okay, where do you want it? <laughs> And you're thinking, that is way too much. If you're single, you're going. you got to be kidding me. Hey, no, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not. It takes work. Relationship always takes work. If it doesn't take work, it's not worth anything. I didn't say salvation. Do you want authority? 
Do you want power? Well, before you get power, you need authority. And before you get authority, you need relationship. And that's what we have to work at. Submission goes from obedience to a willingness. You ever done something for God and went, okay. <laughs> we want to grow in that to where we say, okay, Lord. And it takes humility. What did Jesus do? Adam lost his authority. And the world turned upside down. Alan, Adam said to the cat, come here, cat. And the cat went, <laughs> <laughs> Dog didn't do that, cat did. <laughs> Jesus, the unique one, the only one qualified, the second Adam came to restore authority. Through relationship with the Father, by submission to the nth degree, with humility. This is what makes him so unique. No one else is qualified to be our Savior. No one. No one. Everyone else is a mere man, a mere woman, or the creation of the Almighty God. Everything. No religious system can save you. No amount of proxy from someone else can save you. No other, there is salvation given unto no one else. There is one name by which men was, must be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the unique one, the Son of God, the one who came to destroy the works of Satan and bring chaos back into order to take those who were far from him and bring us back to him. No one else can do that. Who will stand before you on that day when you stand before the Lord God Almighty and try to plead your case? Who will be your representative? It's one of two men. It is either Adam, which all who are in Adam die, or it is either Jesus, the Savior, the one who reconciles us to God. Who will it be for you? Look at the example of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 in the Amplified Bible says, Have this same attitude in yourselves which was in Christ Jesus. Look to Him as your example of selfless humility, who although He existed in the form and unchanging essence of God as one with Him, possessing the fullness of all the divine attributes, the entire nature of deity did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or asserted as if he did not already possess it or was afraid of losing it. Verse 7, but he emptied himself without renouncing or diminishing his deity, but only, tempora by, uh, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine uh, equality and his rightful dignity. How did he empty himself? By assuming the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man, he became completely human, but was without sin, being fully God and fully man. That's an awesome description of Jesus. How are you people sitting down right now? Don't stand up. Don't, please. I'm not, I don't want to bait the witness. No. Here we go. All right. Where was I? Ooh, fully man. Verse 8. After he was found in terms of his outward appearance as a man for a divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still further by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. Oh. Jesus empties himself of his glory from eternity past. So much so that when he came, nobody recognized his divinity. Except a few people. Some shepherds. Some wise men from the east. 
he had so veiled himself of his glory that he was just average. He was just a dude. That's why they would say, Jesus of Nazareth, because there's a lot of men named Jesus. Of Nazareth? Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's like being from Baker, California. <laughs> Serious? He had so veiled his godliness, but was still God. And he further emptied himself by dying on the cross. In the ultimate shame, the King of kings and the Lord of lords hanging on a cross. I've often wondered why it had to be so brutal. Why did it have to be so terrible, so excruciating? I don't know the answer. I know it was prophesied that's how it would happen. And I guess the answer is that because that's the way God scripted it. You ever heard anybody say this to you? What does Jesus know about my pain? <laughs> oh, bro, great question. It's a great question if you don't know. Let me explain to you what he knows about being a refugee, about being homeless, about not having birds of the air have nests and foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, about betrayal, about abandonment. Even from your own family who didn't get his mission. About crucifixion and the hurt and the pain of dying. Basically alone if you count the two thieves next to him and some, a few people and some Roman soldiers. About being laid in a borrowed tomb because he didn't have one. He who created the stars and quasars and the galaxies upon galaxies was placed in a borrowed tomb. What does God know about pain and suffering and hurt? Of his seven or so statements from the cross, profound. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Yeah, he gets it. Yeah, he gets it. And you're not alone. You'll never be alone. And he understands. Yeah, he understands. It says this in verse 9, for this reason also, because he obeyed. How do you get authority in the kingdom? Relationship. God the Son, God the Father, relationship to the nth degree. How do you get authority in the kingdom? Obedience. How do you get power? Mm. Relationship. Obedience. Power. For this reason also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. We're listening to this from the context of authority. Because <laughs> we have a newfound love for the authority of God in our lives. So because of this pathway, God raised him up. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And then every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, sovereign God, to the glory of God the Father. It wasn't even for His own glory. It was for the glory of God the Father. So Jesus received all authority. All of it. Kings, queens, dictators, governments, thrones, kingdoms. All. 
Surrender to Jesus. Fast forward, this is where it gets personal. Because he received authority, he gives authority. And he gives authority to you and to me. Authority restored. Is this exciting stuff? Uh, you probably already know this, but here we go. What are you going to do with this authority, church? Well, he tells us. Same thing he told the disciples. It says in Matthew 28, 18, again from the Amplified Bible, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, that is all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all ethne, all people, groups. Help, what does that mean? Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Part two, then teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, because obedience brings authority, and authority brings power. He says, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, to the end of the age. And can you say amen to that? Amen. Jesus says, I'm giving you authority. Great authority. Woo! No, we want power. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. What have we been saying? Before you get power, you get authority. And before you get authority, you get int intimacy with God so that you would yield that authority and that power with humility and love. See, if you have power, but you don't have love, you disqualify yourself. I'm giving you authority to what? To go make disciples. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Habakkuk 2.12 For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Go and perpetuate the kingdom. Church, this is you. You cannot delegate this to someone else. You can't say, well, yeah, that's what, you know, the pastors and evangelists and missionaries, that's what they do. But, you know, me, I'm just a believer. Oh, no. You have authority to go and to make disciples. True discipleship. Here's what it looks like. It looks like me not just talking to someone. That is the preaching of the Word of God. And sometimes, if you'll admit it, it's easier to tell someone about Jesus than it is to invite them into your life in discipleship. Not even evangelists get that past. They tell people the good news, but they need to be discipling too. If those I disciple, secondly, are not discipling others, perpetuating the knowledge of the glory of God into others, then that's gone one generation. Here is the test of true discipleship. First of all, am I willing to take the Jesus-given authority that he has given me and out of obedience to him, go and make disciples, which is ugly and it's messy, and sometimes you have to hang out with people you would rather not hang out with, and you have to invite them into your world, and they might mess up your carpet. <laughs> Pastor Chuck Smith, years ago, during the, the, the Jesus movement, all these hippies, Young people, Google it. All these hippies were coming into church and somebody comes up to Chuck Smith and says, hey, man, these hippies are not wearing shoes and they're messing up the carpet. He goes, rip the carpet out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you get it, right? Good. Let's just have cement floors. I mean, how religious is that? To be concerned more for stains on the carpet than the souls of people? If what, if who I disciple doesn't reproduce itself, that's only one generation. That's not true discipleship. I'm going to challenge you, church, as I challenge myself. I'm on a journey this year, this is per me personally, to discover what real discipleship looks like. And guess what? I don't include Sunday in that. I'm reprioritizing my schedule. Because here's what matters. Others. We receive so much information about Christ. 
I'm challenging myself to do something with the information that I receive. And I'm choosing to walk. I'm challenging myself to walk in the authority that God has given me to disciple others. What does that mean? That means come alongside of me as I come alongside of you. Watch, walk with me. Come into my life. You might even be at my dinner table. Oh. When I was in youth ministry, it was easy. Because, because it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a cycle and, 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 I, and it was easy to, to invite kids into my life. It should be no less easy right now. Confirmation. I had a young man who came last service, a friend of mine. And, and we, we, we had chatted back and forth and he's you know, a former ball player, coach, and just a great guy. And we're just chatting and stuff. And he goes, hey man, what you said today, would you, would you spend that time with me and would you would you disciple me? What was I going to say? You know what, let me check my schedule. Well, sorry, man, I'm all booked up. Of course I will. Of course I will. And he didn't know what the subject matter was today, but that's where it ended up. I call that confirmation. Church. Who are you pouring your life into? One-on-one, two-on-one, small group scenario. Who are you inviting into your world? This is true discipleship. When Jesus told the disciples, come and follow me, they understood what it meant. It meant, I'm giving everything away. Peter and John have the catch of a lifetime. And Jesus says, drop your nets and come and follow me. And they did. Because he's calling them into his life. We have so much information. If transformation is not happening to those around us, maybe we need to consider what it might look like to invest our lives in someone and, with no holds barred, to sh- open up our scars, to help pray with people. Iron sharpening iron. I just, I, 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 just, I just feel like I don't understand discipleship, guys. I don't get it. I'm willing, though. I'm willing to learn. Now I know what you're thinking. Great, you tell us the program and we'll institute it. Do you really think discipleship is a program? It can be. It's a, it's a part of it. Do you really think that discipleship is, is, is regimented like that? Here's what it is. It's biblical. It's relational. It's systematic. I didn't tell my buddy, hey man, what you doing on Thursdays? Every Thursday? No, it ain't going to be like that. It's going to be like, let's get together, face to face. Can we do it over Zoom? No. <laughs> well, you don't understand. I work till 2 in the morning. We'll figure it out. I hope that you will join Jesus in his journey. First and foremost, because it is the Zoe life. And secondly, that you would join him in his journey to take the life of Christ, the Zoe of Christ, and to pour yourself out to others. I don't know what that looks like. It's not a religious system, I know that. It's organic. Do you know what organic is? It's raw, it's real, it's fresh. It's filled with nutrients. It's beautiful, helps things grow, that, that. Let's be a people who take what God has given. Come on, Joseph, come on up, brother. You got the right idea. You know, when the worship man stands up, you know you're done. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Come on up, bro. Hey, <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I work alone. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Let us, um, let us pray. I would like all of us to have ongoing conversations about how we are growing in Christ and how we've got someone along for the journey and how we are instructing, teaching, helping, coming alongside them so that they can go and tell others. 
the same thing. And so that they can go and tell others the same thing. Not for our glory. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And that God would use us to do some amazing things. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Joseph? Oh, you call me out of darkness. You silence every light. And no other voice will define me. I belong to you. I belong to you. You know the enemy can't take what I have, change who I am, I belong to you. You know the enemy can't take what I have, change who I am, I belong to you. Greater are you who sin me than he who sin the world. The word you have spoken are stronger than the curse. Greater are you who sin me than he who sin the world. The word you have spoken are stronger than the curse. Stronger than the curse. You know the enemy can't take what I have, change who I am. I belong to you. You know the enemy can't take what I have. Change who I am, I belong to you, I belong to you, I belong to you. No one can take from me my destiny, I belong. To you.